we have uh, Dr. Keith Van Heron from Stanford University, and he's going to talk to us about updates on vitamin D's effects in ALD. Uh, thanks. Great job again to the McDaniels. That was really nice. And um, yeah, lots of great questions there. You can see really connected. So. Uh, okay, so I've given a couple of updates on where we're at with understanding um, ALD and whether vitamin D might have some uh, role in uh, in kids with ALD. Um, I'm going to provide an update today on where we're at. Um, just a, it's it's a, I would say it's a big data update. I want to give a big shout out to the team who's um, been putting this together over the years. Now um, we have a couple people in our lab um, that are contribute a lot of this data. I would say uh, Dohip Kim here in the middle has done the um, the bulk of the bioinformatics analysis, so you'll see data from him. Um, and then Isha uh, Kasho and Azad Hashemi have done some of the animal model work. And a big shout out to um, Ali Fatimi, uh, Peter Barker, Ann Moser, Jerry Raymond, and Josh Bunkowski, who contribute a lot of data to this as well. So um, just to give you a sense of where this started, we'll give a quick uh, background here for those who are, who are slightly unfamiliar, but so as most of you know, only about a third of ALD boys historically would get brain lesions. We don't know why some boys get these and others don't. This is one of the most important questions for the community is understanding why it is that some kids get this and others are spared. Um, the lesions, if they begin, um, they begin small and this is where they most often occur. This is the you know the back of the brain, and they consist of this is a a picture a microscopic picture of the cells involved here, which we'll come back to later, but it involves activation of um, certain immune cells in the brain, and then the recruitment of other immune cells. And for purposes of the talk later, these are um, monocytes and microglia. And these lesions, if they're left untreated, this is not the same patient, by the way, just, just to be clear. But if left untreated, perhaps a year or two uh, time might pass and the lesion would continue to grow. We do see some other features here, including decreased blood flow. Um, and uh, this is how the lesions evolve. The clearest risk factor we have so far is that age is a factor, and as you can see here, between the ages of four and eight is kind of the peak risk. This is from uh, Dr. Malik's uh, data set. Um, so this black line represents the relative um, percent of kids in a, in a population that might develop cerebral ALD at any given age. And so we, we took this at, uh, on a research basis a bit further to say, well, uh, okay, um, there are other diseases that are not ALD, but are similar enough that we could maybe take some take some guesses to try and understand why some people get brain lesions and others do not. And uh, to many of us, multiple sclerosis is one of very uh, plenty of similarities. These are inflammatory demyelinating brain lesions. Um, this is a picture from a, a child with NMS diagnosis. These are the uh, demyelinating lesions. They look quite a bit like those in ALD. And in MS, quite famously, the, uh, the incidence, meaning the frequency of disease, varies by latitude. So the further north you are of the equator, or if you're below the equator, the further south you are, the, uh, the higher the incidence is. And over many years, this has been parsed out to be at least primarily or, par or partly related to vitamin D status. And so we looked at the same features in, um, in ALD. And so Dr. Bronkowski looked at a, a data set from um, children all over the U.S. and found that uh, latitude predicted the incidence of cerebral ALD. And uh, Jerry Raymond and Moser uh, and I had looked at vitamin D levels in kids before they had brain lesions and found that um, kids with who later developed brain lesions had lower levels of vitamin D. Um, and, uh, and those with higher levels, at least in this population, had, um, had fewer, uh, had a lower risk. I, I do want to point out here 
th this is um, this is the level of vitamin D, and you can see there's this is actually the same patient here. Each of these patients has two me at least two measures, so there are ten patients in each group. This patient has pretty high levels of vitamin D, and they still got cerebral disease. I, I want to be clear about this. This is we're looking for risk reduction. This is not a cure. Um, if if it's anything, what we're shooting for is risk reduction. Um, so um, the question is really how might vitamin D uh, work in ALD? And when we set out here, this was years ago. I, I mean, I we were we were taking uh, an educated guess based on what was known in the uh, in the MS literature, among other places, and we knew that um, vitamin D did um, inhibit some inflammatory markers, at least in some cells. And um, and in our best guess of some of the early data, we saw signs that vitamin D might also work as an antioxidant. And this was somewhat novel when we started looking at it, but the data has accumulated and that this is now a little, there's a little more evidence for this, including ours. And the idea here is that these, um, these uh, uh, mechanisms might be responsible for the reduction in cell injury and cell death in, in the cell pathways. But um, so an anti-inflammatory and an antioxidant mechanism were primarily what we were looking at. And uh, some time ago, we had set up a vitamin D pilot study, enrolled actually 21 children in total. Um, we enrolled at two sites at Stanford and Kennedy Krieger. Um, and for the purposes of our data set here, we're really comparing, this is a single arm, meaning everyone got this, uh, everyone got vitamin D. The comparisons we did were generally between the end of the study and the beginning of the study. So we compared patients to themselves at the beginning of the study. This is an important limitation of this kind of study. It does not have a control arm. In other words, the patients are their own controls. There are strengths and weaknesses to this, but it's, it's, this is not a definitive causal study, and I just want to qualify that as we look through here. We did increase the vitamin D levels in the blood. They went from a median of about um, 28 to a median of about uh, 55, and um, that was that was pretty clear from the results. We did um, increase cerebral blood flow, which again we think this is probably good, although we, we um, this is. Uh, um, this is not clearly caused by vitamin D, although we did find a correlation um, of dose. Um, but we, we think this is probably a good thing uh, because this area of the brain is harder to perfuse. And there is some evidence um, from Dr. Eichler and Dr. Mussolino that one of the challenges, one of the problems that may, may lead to early lesions is diminished blood flow or irregular blood flow. So we think this could be good. And then we looked at antioxidant levels in the brain. And this is done by looking at essentially using kind of a, a chemistry technique, spectro MR spectroscopy, magnetic, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. We, it's just an add on to an MRI image where we measure um, glutathione levels in this part of the brain where lesions typically begin. And we did have one patient who entered the study who had a positive, who had a lesion at that time. And we did get a we happened to get a spectroscopy measure from that patient. His level was on the lower end of those we measured. And then for each patient here, you can see how their levels would kind of uh, tracked up. This was a significant increase for these patients over time. Again, uh, this is an uncontrolled study. Um, so we're just comparing patients to themselves. But we think this is, again, evidence that um, would be favorable for the most part for um, vitamin D's effects. And then we looked at the evolution of um, essentially thousands of metabolomic markers, which started kind of collect collectively over here at baseline. And in this analysis appeared to move closer to controls, uh, which again, we think would be favorable. So let's assume for the moment that these changes are due to vitamin D. So then how, how is vitamin D doing these things? And um, from here, we moved on to try and get a molecular analysis. And we did this with funding from several, um, several groups, including um, Urvidershi ALD, um, the Lucas Project, and uh, the Stanford uh, Maternal Ch uh, Child Health Research Institute. Um, this is 
pretty expensive work we 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 delved into, and it took a lot of it's still taking time. Um, but these are very complicated data sets. And let me tell you a little bit what we did. So we took patients' blood, um, and historically, what we would do with that blood is we would take all the immune cells in the blood. There are many different kinds of immune cells in our blood. They're each unique, and we would typically just mash them all up and get basically a sequence from the cells to tell us what proteins they're making. That tells us you know, what the cells are doing, how they changed. And in this case, we would compare them to from the end of the study to the beginning of the study to try and figure out what did, this, what did these cells do differently at the end of the study than they were doing at the beginning of the study. And we used to look at them all, all mixed together. Um, so we had, uh, our research team had previously worked on um, vitamin D research in MS. And we had, um, based on literature, that lumping these cells together doesn't produce a very good signal. So we had separated the cells using an older technology and found a much better signal when we separated the cells into groups. Fast forward a few years, we now have a newer technology that allows us to, to sequence individual cells and, base, and essentially get thousands of um, RNA transcripts. This tells, tells you what the cell, what kind of proteins the cell is building, what it's doing. And we can do that for every cell. So we're getting this over thousands of cells, and this tells us far more information. And it tells us how each group of cells is responding uniquely to vitamin D in this case. So um, this is the work of uh, Dr. Kim in our lab. Uh, so he, over, um, uh, over time, has compiled a really detailed list here. And I want to show. So previously, we would take um, one set of transcripts for each patient. Now we have thousands and thousands of transcripts from each patient. So each one of these dots here is um, what we would essentially do once for each patient. Um, each one of these dots is a cell, and each one has its own unique transcript of attached to it. So it's a lot of data. And it does require a fair amount of heavy computational um, power and time. So this is uh, it's ongoing, but we've made some progress. I want to point out that each of these groups is clustered based on this unique transcriptional uh, profile. And um, over many years, the scientific community has compiled algorithms that tell you the identity of each cell based on its profile. And that's what this map is here. This is called a UMAP. And I can tell you that, as I mentioned before, um, the monocytes, these cells down here, are cells that we are generally interested in ALD because they are found at the site of the lesion and they, and they are quite closely related to the brain cells that are most early, um, early that are involved earliest in lesion development, those are brain microglia. So we have focused our investigation for the moment on these cells here to look at these immune cells. And they, are, they split into two major types. These CD14 monocytes are the most common. These are the classical pro-inflammatory monocytes, and these are the, uh, the, uh, the, the monocytes, sort of their, their yin-yang. These are the anti-inflammatory monocytes, and these are the two cell groups we were focused on for our study. And here's what this, just to give you a glimpse of what this allows you to do. So these are six genes that we had some interest in at the outset. Um, I'm going to go into detail for some of these a little bit later, but um, this is uh, a fatty acid, a, a gene involved in fatty acid metabolism. You can see it's most prominently expressed, this dark purple down here, in the monocytes themselves. You can. This is another inflammatory uh, marker, NFKB, I believe. It's on my screen here, too. Um, again, this is more diffusely expressed. But you can see that this is um, each of these genes is expressed at different levels in different cell populations, and in some cases, it's only expressed in a subset of cells. So, looking at thousands of these gene transcripts, we can see that in some cases uh, there were genes that were generally decreased at 12 months compared to the start. In other cases, they were increased at 12 months, and the cells that tended to have the, most, the biggest changes were monocytes. Now, this is not, we don't think, unique to ALD. We, it so happens that vitamin D is uniquely 
active in monocytes. This was part of our original interest in vitamin D for ALD. Um, uh, vitamin D is a steroid hormone that's kind of active in many, many parts of the body, but, uh, but among the places where it, it has special access and privileges is in monocytes. Um, so we see that there are some significant changes here, uh, both up and down. We use some special computer software uh, that's, um, that tells us kind of major pathways that change in these cell subsets. And um, this, is, this is the power of single cell sequencing, is we can see very distinct pathways, in some cases, exactly opposite effects of vitamin D on different monocytes. So our pro-inflammatory monocytes, we see our top pathway is this mitochondrial pathway called oxidative phosphorylation. And our anti-inflammatory monocytes, the, the pathway that decreased the most was the same pathway. So they were, in many cases, working in opposite directions. And this is, in one sense, how we think about these cells very broadly, is one has one acts in one direction and one acts in the other. But I, I was a little surprised to see that they went in the opposite direction in this case. Um, I will say, um, Making meaning out of this means understanding what it is that we're what, what it is that we want to change, and we don't know what it is we want to change exactly. We have some guesses. Um, what uh, I'll come back to this, but this is one of the major. This is uh, again we're learning as we go what it is that we want these cell profiles to look like. Uh, we want them to be, I would say, uh, closer to normal, and we want them to be probably less inflammatory and more. Metabolically healthy, but we we're still not sure exactly what all these features mean. So uh, hold this thought, and we'll, we'll move through some more data here. This um, this is uh, th I'm going to get a little technical here. I'm just going to show you some of the some of the deeper workings here, just for just for um, cases in point. This is one pathway that actually is kind of a um, a major um, inflammatory regulatory pathway that's involved in a lot of um, kind of deep. Um, immune regulation. And we see that in our pro-inflammatory monocytes, this pathway, PIP3 pathway, is generally decreased, and in the CD16 is generally increased. Again, just highlighting the, the power and also the, 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 the challenges that come with this, this level of data inquiry. Um, another interesting feature here is a decrease in this um, uh, long-chain ACEL-CoA synthetase 1 this is what we were interested in at the outset because it's involved in some of the um, cell injury pathways we're interested in. This, among other things, is involved in fatty acid transport and, and can be involved. It's not, you know, these, many of these have different functions, but it can be involved in this uh, particular inflammasome pathway. And I want to point out here that in our two monocyte populations we're looking at, it generally goes down. And another cell population, the only other one that's really expressed, it goes up. So which is the which is the therapeutic cell population? I don't know. Um, and uh, I would say that it, you know it's we're assuming that down in this case is better, and that that is uh, also a qualified caveat because we don't understand enough about the drivers of cerebral ALD. Um, we looked at a few other pathways, particularly ferroptosis. Um, ferroptosis is a cell death pathway that can be uh, uh, triggered by decreased glutathione levels and increased oxidative stress. We have a kind of a longstanding interest in this pathway. We found that, we found that uh, some of the key markers were downregulated, um, these markers here that, that drive ferroptosis. And this cell here, uh, G, or this uh, protein here, GPX4, which is involved in glutathione recycling, this was upregulated, which we think is good. This helps inhibit ferroptosis. Um, uh, TNF signaling was broadly decreased. This is partly regulated through the PIP3 pathway. Um, again, NLRP3 signaling we think was, was uh, decreased, and these are mostly in CD14 uh, populations. And so, again, I'm showing you a long list of very complicated pathways. My point here is um, these are... Uh, there is a lot of data here to learn from. There are some key pieces we, we, we don't know, but we're working toward. Um, one of the key pathways we'd like to use going forward is 
our, our, our new mouse model for cerebral ALD. Um, at, a, at, a at some of the previous ALD meetings we've, we've uh, shown, um, this is a, what we think is a really promising new mouse model that combines um, a couple of models from the MS world and combines them with the ALD mouse and seems to produce a result that looks really like a pretty good mimic for cerebral ALD. So we're quite pleased with how this model looks and its potential for understanding cerebral ALD pathogenesis and perhaps more importantly for developing um, therapies for clinical trials to try and prioritize therapies for clinical trials. And this is just our our um, one example here of um, doc so Dr. Hashemi had had developed this uh, animal model, and Dr. Kaushal had uh, run this um, ex this set of experiments in the in the model using vitamin D, and what she did was um, essentially start the um, the baby mice on vitamin D very early at a few weeks of life and treated them for effectively the first 10 years of, of their life um, with, with, in mouse years uh, with vitamin D and, uh, and, then, um, and then induced the, um, the brain lesions around that time. And um, the mice did have very different vitamin D levels. I would say that this is at, at the very least a very good model for vitamin D deficiency. Um, because you could see the mice who got low levels of vitamin D had very low levels of vitamin D in the blood. And it did produce a, a, a promising result, meaning that mice who had higher levels of vitamin D down here, these bottom colors, they, these are the wild type, meaning the non-genetically modified mice, and these are just the ALD mice. The mice on the lower end here had lower scores, meaning their disease was less severe. And we can see this, we looked at this in many, from many angles. We looked at this um, histologically through different markers. We looked at this through MRI. And we saw effectively the same result in every, in every, in every mode. Um, among them is this, these are the um, monocytes that are activated in the corpus callosum um, at each uh, level of vitamin D supplementation. So this is low vitamin D supplementation. We see the mice had high um, activity of the monocytes. These are pro-inflammatory monocytes, um, medium dose, slightly reduced, um, higher dose, slightly lower still. And this is uh, in graphical format of the mice summarized here. So we think that this is um, as good a data as we have to date that uh, suggesting that at least vitamin D deficiency is a danger um, for predisposing, in our, at least in our model, um, to the extent that our model represents cerebral LD. We, it, it's a model, but it's a, but we think it's a, we think it's a good start. Combined with what we see from our human data, um, we think that's where we're going to going to find more more insight. So our um, uh, so this is one of the step places we want to go from here is to try and dive into the molecular mechanics of how it's working in the mouse model to see if what we're finding in our um, you know, from our vitamin D trial of otherwise healthy boys is, you know, going to be helpful in our mouse, something similar to be helpful in our mouse model. Um, so much more to do there. Um, in the meantime, we are, we have, uh, I, I, it was some time ago that I updated the group on, on a submission to the NIH on a vitamin D uh, trial. Um, Miranda gave me a great name for part of the trial. Would you call it the um, the stay at home trial? Or trial at home? Yes, thank you. So um, part of this trial would include a um, uh, it would involve basically a central lab. That lab core is a lab um, a commercial lab with sites all over the country, as shown in these dots here, and it would allow um, people from all over the country to simply um, enroll from their home site and potentially. Um, participate with us. And then we have some other um, dedicated study sites as demarcated by these yellow stars here, and then some other um, expert academic sites highlighted in the gray stars that, that would um, either refer patients or, or directly enroll patients in different parts of the study. 
this, um, if funded, would um, would provide a very large um, uh, or a much larger vitamin D trial, where um, that would allow the possibly for for actually several hundred kids to be enrolled and um, tried on a particular dose of vitamin D. Um, it would, I think, perhaps just as importantly, help us um, build a very large data infrastructure and data repository to collect um, uh, samples and data on kids from all over the country to understand why it is that some kids develop brain lesions and others do not, or why some kids develop adrenal insufficiency and others do not. I think um, that this that would that's a, that's about half the study is understanding these features, and the other half is running a trial. So I really um, I'm very keen to get this funded. We should hear from the NIH in about six months of just a score. Our first our first um, submission scored pretty well, but it wasn't funded. What that means is you try again and you 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 make changes that the NIH suggests if you think they're appropriate. We thought they were generally good suggestions. And we resubmitted. So we've got a very large team of investigators on this. Um, I would say uh, everyone in this room, the ALD, uh, the ALD neurologist is part of this study, Lorian, Eric, Troy. Um, and uh, so uh, Jerry site is involved too. The, uh, so it's going to be a big effort. And um, it's, I will say it's a very expensive study for the NIH. It's a big investment in the ALD community if they make it. Um, and uh, it's it's no 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 small thing for um, the NIH to invest this this much in, in in our disease at this point, but we think it's a really good investment and that will pay big dividends going forward. Um, okay, you you still have a say in how we design this. I I know I said we submitted a trial, but your say your say in how we how we design this version or future versions still matters. This trial is available to you. It's available. Um, through the, um, I think a link on the website, Miranda, you said? Oh, in the chat, sorry, okay, Miranda's putting in the chat. Um, this is not a memorable link here, so you'll, you'll, have, to, uh, you'll have to rely on, a, on an email link for it, but um, this is a survey just to get your vote on what kind of study you'd like to participate in uh, for, as a vitamin D design, so. All right, so to summarize, um, this is, so I've shown you the transcriptional signatures from our vitamin D pilot study. Uh, and I, what we can see right now is it clearly differs by cell type. So assuming that what we're seeing are vitamin D signatures, and we think they, that many of these uh, features we're seeing are because they are consistent with the broader literature on vitamin D. Um, some of these changes are consistent with an anti-inflammatory and an antioxidant effect, as we have proposed, but it's more complicated than we thought. In other words, it's affecting different cells um, in different ways. And we're, we need to know to understand what is good and what is bad. We need to understand um, what is um, what does uh, the immune profile of kids with um, regular ALD and cerebral ALD and no ALD look like, and what does what do the lesions in the brain look like on a molecular level? We have some insight, but we're working on more. Um, these are our most important next steps on this, I think, to really understand what the signature is. And I, I guess I want to qualify here, too. Vitamin D is not, there are other therapies that are designed specifically for ALD. Gene therapy that Dr. Eichler's lab is working on. Um, the Minorex therapy that uh, Minorex is working on. And Bluebird Bio is, uh, has a gene therapy that they've already developed in a snow group. These are specific for ALD and would have much more targeted effect. Vitamin D is, a, is relevant here because it is um, naturally occurring. We, our bodies make it anyway. It has some general health benefits. And as far as we can tell right now, it's actually very safe to take in general. On the safe note, it is not safe at every level. More is not always better. Um, so please, please I just want to, I just want to make, make sure I put, point this out. Um, is, uh, we do think we're seeing some effects that could be helpful. I can promise you that at super high doses that will eventually be harmful. So please, um, please take that note of caution here, and, and uh, um, uh, don't uh, don't uh, buy the, buy out uh, the CVS uh, supply of vitamin D and try and give it to your child in one go. Um, I, I do think that there is going to be um, there's a there's a famous um, saying from from an ancient physician uh, 
Paracelsus, um, that uh, says uh, the dose is the poison, meaning it's how much you give that, that provides the therapy in many cases. And so giving too much and too little is the thing that, uh, the thing that is dangerous. So finding the right dose matters. But I think also um, uh, really understanding how things work is going to make a big difference for how we go forward. So we're um, moving forward with studying uh, vitamin D in, um, in our mouse model. And we have some other human uh, immune cell subsets uh, from some collaborators we're very grateful for. We'll hopefully be able to show you more detail about what we think is a good therapeutic correction in the future. Um, we should have a funding update from NIH in about uh, well, six months, well, three to six months from now. So um, I want to give a big thanks to uh, our funders here. This A lot of this was funded by grassroots donations. Um, so the, uh, the um, single cell sequencing, a lot of this was funded from uh, the Broussard Denenberg family at Riverdale ALD and the Adler family. Um, the Max Lenaimo Rail Fund helped fund the mouse model. Um, the Virginia B. Toolman Foundation helped fund our, um, our bioinformatics specialist and the Anderson family also helped fund our mouse model. Um, the NIH funded the trial and the Maternal Child Health Research Institute Stanford actually has funded a whole, whole broad array of uh, pieces and, and background work here. So I'm grateful to all these funders and to many, actually a lot of, I think a lot of families have donated too. So my thanks to everyone who donated and especially to the families who joined our trial. Um, here's our research team once again, and I'll close there and take questions if we have time. And uh, we do a video at the end, I'll show it when I, when I finish here, but uh, okay. Keith, Keith, sorry, Dean back here. Um, there's a question online, which given your caveat, you may not want to answer the first one, but maybe the second one. It says, how much vitamin D are you using, and will it be used as a supplement from the time of diagnosis? Uh, um, so the in our, in our pilot study, we used a, a wide range of doses. Um, what we've settled on for our future trial is something in the more moderate realm of, we. the dose varies by weight. It's a fairly kind of long list, I'll, uh, but it's something in the range of 50 to 100 IU per day. The average is going to be 70, about 75 IU per day. Um, so IU is international units of vitamin D. That's approximately what we think is a reasonable dose. I will say that that dose will produce a wide range of effects. So some people will, their levels rise a little bit, others will rise a lot. And um, the biggest predictor we found of our, how high your vitamin D will respond, how much, how far your dose will jump is actually how high your level is when you first get it. So the higher your level when you first get your dose, the higher your level is likely to be in response to the dose you get. Um, so there's a, a certain feature built in, uh, a certain bit of biology that's built into that. Um, and what was the second question? The second part was, will it be used as a supplement from the time of diagnosis? Uh, that is, so for our, um, for our trial at home, um, that would be, yeah, you are, we would like to have everyone eligible from birth. Um, and whether or not that is going to be helpful is the question, is part of the question to answer in the study. Um, but, uh, yeah, could one do it? That would be the goal for the study. Um, yeah, I was going to ask if you had uh, what your thoughts were on the timeline for your study and your outcome measures, because I feel like, you know, that's a long goal. Yeah. So the question was uh, timeline and outcome measures. A great question. Thank you. Um, so the timeline would be, it would essentially be a three-year study. So those who'd be enrolling would be signing up for three years. In other words, you're, you're, you're hopefully joining us for the full three-year three -year run. The outcome measures are whether the primary outcome measure is the um, development of brain lesions. We would also follow, um, you know, adrenal functions over time. We would also um, follow other markers of inflammation over time, and we would try and um, uh, take small blood samples essentially with each visit. So you'd have um, there would be uh, seven blood draws throughout the study every six months effectively when you're getting your, your the labs checked. We'll follow your vitamin D levels, of course, but then also follow 
um, your adrenal labs and then save some blood for um, other studies that would help us understand who's at risk for disease and who's not and, and in the future do more single cell sequencing to understand this better. Sorry? Oh, sorry, there was another question over here. Um, so I was kind of intrigued about uh, the data you had there on the incidence of cerebral ALD at the higher latitudes. So it just kind of made me curious. My son, we're from Canada, and uh, he was diagnosed with cerebral disease at diagnosis. Um, but ironically, he was one of those kids that kind of pounded back the milk like nobody's business. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where he stood with that. But for people like, you know, in Canada or in those really super high latitudes, would you then want practitioners to be on the lookout for those deficiencies in the vitamin D for their patients? Yeah. I, um, so vitamin, I would say the easiest thing to say is that we should prevent vitamin D deficiency in, in kids with ALD. Um, I would say that's a very reasonable goal because it has other health benefits too. Um, if I were to guess, I would say that's where we're going to get the most benefit. And I say that because that's what the rest of the vitamin D literature looks like, is the biggest benefit is preventing deficiency. And deficiency um, is uh, still a, a, for a vitamin D is still a somewhat fuzzy category where different um, medical organizations define it differently. Um, but generally, levels above 30 are considered you know, non-deficient. Our study is to, in our and uh, for various reasons, it's shooting for levels, usually a little above 40, between 40 and 60, 40 maybe. And so, y yes, um, it's higher latitudes. People spend more time inside um, because of the cold weather. And, and also in the wintertime, there actually isn't enough sunlight and the right kind of sunlight to, to actually generate vitamin D. So about half the year in Canada are could be off a little bit there, but close to half the year, there isn't enough sunlight to generate vitamin D, so it's pretty equal. I would say Canada has a better um, standard of care for managing vitamin D deficiency more generally, be, partly because of their normal latitude and partly because they have good, um, uh, good uh, socialized medicine, so they can roll out, uh, well, <laughs> it's very different. Yeah, they can roll things out at least in a more standardized fashion than we can. It's a little more piecemeal here in the U.S. in terms of standardizing. That was great, Keith, uh, and and such a key piece of this uh, pathophysiology. So, thanks for addressing this. So, two questions. One is, you showed this nice data on monocyte gene expression uh, or CD14, CD16 cells, positive cells. These are very dynamic cells, monocytes. How stable is this on test retest? Is I guess one question, and you know, thinking that we probably are dealing with a two hit. Uh, scenario for cerebral ALD, uh, so these cells might be acting very differently in, in scenarios of inflammation or trauma, as we know, that can set things off. And the second question is, given that the effects that you might be looking at are not specific to ALD, as, as your wild-type mouse is suggesting, is there any way to enhance power and piggyback on other studies that are occurring in other populations to enhance power and accelerate? Um, yeah, great questions, Florian. Um, so, yeah, I mean, one of the challenges with measuring anything in the immune system is it's by design, it tended to be dynamic in response to whatever is happening in the environment. I, it's, I don't know how stable each of these features would be. Um, we do have a, it's a good question, and we have a couple of samples that were drawn I think maybe a couple months apart, and it might be an interesting question. We, I think we have sequencing on some of them where we could actually ask that question and look. It's a, I hadn't occurred to me, I'll, I'll, we, we could see. Um, but I would, uh, um, more generally, I, I think, um, yes, we're always working on averages. And so um, I think between patients, even looking at kind of the, what we call spaghetti plots, where they show each patient's trajectory you can see that there's a, there's variability in all the measures we, we take um, for, uh, especially for a treatment like vitamin D, which is different than something like chemotherapy where everyone winds up the same level. Um, 
because it's such a potent therapy. Um, but uh, yeah, I think and the, the larger question here is how confident are we that the changes we're seeing are due to vitamin D? And that's where our control will be really helpful. And that's what we're hoping to use, I would say, the mouse model for as much as anything, because that's a, one of the challenges with running human trials with controls is you can't ethically withhold vitamin D treatment for people who are deficient and for good reason. Um, and so you don't really, you can't run a true placebo as easily in a vitamin D trial. You have to do something. You have to modify a little bit. Um, so I think it will be hard to answer exactly in a, uh, in a probably a, the human trials we're imagining. We're, 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 I can tell people we're not planning a placebo controlled trial here. Uh, we have different means to get to gather our control data. The mouse model is probably going to be our best bet on that. And we'll have to draw some inferences. I also think um, that uh, not just in time, but actually in location. I, I, it's sort of my suspicion that actually the immune cells in the periphery are going to have a different signature than the immune cells that are active in the brain. And I mean, we can see that just from, you know, the monocytes that are sitting next to each other in the blood, that they're functioning very differently. And I have a, I have a sense that what we're going to, going to find is that actually the monocytes in the brain lesions have their, their own unique profile and understanding which ones are trying to help and which ones are causing the damage is then going to be its own new problem. I had a, I had, I had a wonderful lab manager in my lab who um, uh, eventually, she spent years in, in science and eventually she said, you know, I, she, she went into um, uh, like a scientific um, environmental quality and she said, I was like, oh, you're so great at this. What, what's, but what is the, you know, why, why, why stop now? She's like, well, every time we, we ask a question, we get an answer. And we, then we just have more questions. And I was like, yes, that is, that is exactly how it goes. It's just, you just wind up with the next question when you, when you get the, what you thought was going to be your answer. And I think that's what we're going to be finding for, for a while longer. Um, but I do think, I mean, I say that, I know I presented a talk where I said we don't, we have effectively, we don't know anything. We don't know what is true. I'm really trying to qualify this to say, um, what we see are things that look like they might be beneficial. But the reality is that diseases are complicated, and we don't really know what the, what the therapeutic direction is. And as Florence pointing out, there's there's probably more than one point in time where um, your um, Im immune context matters, meaning there's something that happens first, and then there's something that happens second, and maybe third. And the immune system may need to respond differently at each point to provide the therapy that's needed at that time. And that's the hard part. Is um, is it may need to provide different responses. Um, that's uh, this is the, um, the 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 fascination and also the the, the misery of, of doing this kind of work is you you think you're making progress you think you've got the answer and then you you wind up still with more questions. Um, but this is how we make progress. I do want to reassure. I do want to assure everyone this is progress. We we really are seeing data here that we didn't. This is actually much further than I ever imagined our vitamin D. Um, story would go, um, and the reason it continues to go is because we're seeing signs that oh, this 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 might be this might be in the right direction, and this might be in the right direction, and so there are pieces here that seem to be coming together. Um, it's too early, but that's what we're looking at. I think piggybacking other diseases, like are you thinking of um, are you thinking of MS, or or I guess do you just mean generally like other is that? But you're thinking not ALD diseases, is that what you mean? Yeah. So we've um, we had started um, a sequencing in. Um, in an MS trial of vitamin D. And, um, and that's where we actually started with our first round of poor man's um, single cells because we, were, we separate our cells into large cell subsets of essentially um, three major cell subsets. And that was our first pass. Um, we just published that a year ago or so. Um, it shows, it shows si signatures that are similar to this. Um, but uh, I would say the clearest thing out of that signature was that um, vitamin D was having an anti-inflammatory effect on the NFKB pathway. It was not as clear as this. I mean, this is much more powerful data um, because we have thousands of replicates um, for each for each cell for each cell population. So it's very different. I mean, this allows us to measure things very precisely. Um, we uh, I think more um, more you know more samples is better power, but 
this, I was very surprised at how much power we got out of this actually from, this is a small study we ran, it was 20, 21 participants and, and not every one of them had um, blood that was usable at every time point. So we, we brought more of even further, but we, we still got what we think is useful data. Other questions? I think um, just just hearing this, very curious about the mouse model, and you you mentioned at uh, age ten or whatever of mouse life, uh, you in, induce the brain lesion. Can, can you ex explain a little bit uh, at a high level how that's done, and um, it, just because of the importance of the mouse model? Yeah. So so for a long time, the limitations of studying of trying to understand and develop treatments for cerebral ALD was that we we only knew what wh how things went wrong and we didn't we could only sort of observe that you know in the in the in the very tragic cases of families who who who'd, um, you know who had children who developed cerebral ALD and so I'll still, I'll say that our, our insights into exactly I still think of cerebral ALD as, as a black box we have you know, really, for for the stage at which other diseases are at, in terms of the the intricacy into which we understand it, say cerebral ALD is is um, we're, we have a very limited understanding of what, what's going on there. One of the reasons is we haven't had an animal model to use to try and study an animal model. I I was just say I'm a big animal lover, so it was it was uh, it was a little bit of uh, um, uh, trepidation that I went into the animal model world, but um, but there are um, insights you can glean from animal models um, that you 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 can't do you can't glean from any human studies, and that largely involves kind of time sequencing of understanding the different stages of disease evolution. So understanding what happens first, second, and third, and um, but models are models, meaning they're not the real thing, and uh, they do simplify things for you, and they simplify sometimes in good ways and sometimes in bad ways. Our mouse model um, builds on what was already a, a, a very useful ALD mouse model in that it replicated the genetic and biochemical features and some of the peripheral nerve and spinal cord features. It didn't have inflammatory brain lesions though, and this had limited um, progress for a long time. Um, one of the postdocs in my lab, um, Dr. Um, Hishemi and um, Dr. Bartkowski at, at Utah came up with some really nice ideas about how to approach this. And so um, so they suggested what kind of what Dr. Eichler was mentioning, what we call the two-hit model. You use not just one thing, but two things um, to try and uh, try and induce um, induce disease. I guess in, in our case, there are maybe three hits. You have the gene defect first, and you have something else that comes second. And figuring out what that something else is, or what that something, those other two or three or four things are, is the trick. In our case, we're we're basically using the models that had been used for multiple sclerosis, where you 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 use an inflammatory agent as one, and then a demyelinating agent is the other, and you combine them together, and it produces a really powerful signature. It does have the same effect in the wild type mouse. It's just not as severe in the wild type mouse. The ALD mouse has a more severe response. Um, so understanding, so that part is where we think we're getting mileage is we can see that ALD mouse is having a much more, there's a lot more going wrong in ALD mouse than there was in the wild type mouse. Um, and um, that's where we think we're going to make some progress in understanding what are the steps in which the, of disease progression, what are the good cells, what are the bad cells, what are the good pathways, what are the bad pathways. And we're, we're in all of the things we're, we're doing, we're trying to pair everything with the human data that's our gold standard so we're trying to look at um, those some families have, have um, donated human brain tissue to places like the NIH brain bank and those those tissue samples can provide really detailed data of what, what are the cells doing that's good and that looks good and what might be doing that's bad and what might be up and what might be not um, and so the mouse model is intended to build on that um, so the mouse model is yeah we essentially induced demyelination in the night in the ALD mice at around um, eight weeks of age. And eight weeks is about 
and roughly, you know, it's adolescence for a couple of months. Uh, how much time do we have? You guys let me know for, I mean, I know we were a little ahead of time, but show video. Okay. Um, one more question. Oh, treatment. Yeah, I didn't show that it. Yes, we, actually, yes, Stefan will probably get, be annoying me. I didn't show the lipidomic. So um, the question was, have you looked at levels of C26 um, before and after? Yeah. It, there's no evidence that vitamin D changed the, uh, the C26 levels. It did change some other lipidomic profiles, which um, I hope Stefan will forgive me. I didn't show. But I, I have to say, it's the, the signature there is also quite mystifying. I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to interpret that. Um, but um, it did not change the, the saturated fatty acid um, levels in the way the way we would normally say this is what we would want to do. It wasn't our expectation uh, necessarily, but we were we would have been happy if it had. Okay, I should I should uh, cede some time here. So the uh, this would be self-explanatory, I think, here in a moment, and this is for Family Weekend 2023, but but. Never mind here. Um, ALD Family Weekend is a um, is a family camp in California. It's open to ALD families across the country. We had our we've had our um, our first in person camp last year after several virtual camps, and it was great fun. We would love to see um, anyone out there who can make it. Um, I'll let the video uh, explain further, and we'll, we'll play it from here. It might seem crazy what I'm about to say
Thank you.